Greetings, lords and ladies. You have been cordially invited to the court of the Channel Chasers podcast. I am your host, King Jay, and joining me as always are my two loyal knights, Brian and Tony. How are you doing tonight, fellas? Doing good, doing good. All right, all right. Greetings, uh, fellow people out there. Now out. All right. <laughs> nice attempt, Brian. Nice attempt. Pachi, pachi, pachi. All right. So th- uh, we're 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 uh, we're a little bit off uh, off kilter uh, uh, for a bit. Peek behind the curtain. Uh, I haven't been able to like update my editing software, so I haven't been able to pull the audio and uh, you know I- I actually be able to you know send it through the process for Tony to fix everything up. So you know, we've been delayed. So likely this is going to be a very old episode by the time you hear it. Uh, but because of that, we had to change our schedule a bit. Well, actually, because I got wrapped up in the world of Persona, I will discuss that later. Uh, we ended up having to change uh subjects originally we were going to cover death and the other details the show that we reacted to um that starred uh violet bean and mandy patinkin it was like the one on the cruise with the like the murder mystery yeah but uh we were gonna cover that yep and that got canceled and then we were gonna cover the gentleman but we then realized that uh jay was in fact wrong he had not seen the movie and Tony and I hadn't seen the movie, and the only way to see the movie is that you rent it. So we were like, "Nope, we're not doing. We're not spending the extra money just for one episode." So we veered to what is currently popular. Who knows by the time you see this episode, movie on Netflix. Yep, uh, and that is Damsel, starring one Millie Bobby Brown. I'm very excited to talk about it. But yeah, before we get into all that, of course, we can't start an episode of the Tantrasers podcast without first jumping right into the news with Brian. Okay, so this is going to be a short one, but one that is close to all of our hearts here. Uh, so apparently DC has announced another live action movie in the works. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's about uh, a few characters that we all love here. Oh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Intrigued. Teen Titans. What? Yeah. Which generation? We don't know. Wait a second. Yeah, no, sure. no, no, no. No, it has to. It has to be. Damien has to be a part of it because Damien's there. Or, no, it could still be Tim. Could still be Tim. Hmm. A yeah. lot well, of possibility know, there. Or it could even be a multiversal story. Could be a multiversal. Could be a multiversal story, like it, in its own thing. It could. It could. It, uh, what would be really cool? I don't think this would be the case. But what would be really cool is if it's a movie set in the past with Dick Grayson Robin, and that's how we get to see Dick Grayson Robin, even though Damien is currently act is the current active Robin. That would be great. I like um, that idea. The only thing that we know about this movie so far, beyond that it's happening. Hmm. Is that the script is being written by uh, Anna Noguera? Probably spelled that said that wrong. Sorry out there. Um, but uh, she's the same uh, relative unknown that's working on the script for Supergirl. Okay, cool. Oh, okay. cool. Nice. That's exciting. I'm I'm very it curious to see me. what generation of Titans it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it also tells me that Gun is uh, Gun and Peter are uh, confident enough in her that they saw like. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, for Supergirl. And I think mm-hmm. it, I, and I think it's smart because, like, if you have, like, if you, uh, because Supergirl is also more than likely going to be a like teenager slash young adult, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, having the same writer behind both properties, uh, like, gives it a, a much more united voice. And I think that it's going to be very important to be more unified because I think that's honestly the problem with uh, the MCU right now is that everything's kind of all over the place tonally and all this different stuff. If DC can manage to build a unified foundation with the Gunverse, then like, I think they have a chance to really be a good contender this time around. I agree 100%. And to push your young adult thing to like support what you were saying, the actress that they have playing Supergirl, Millie Alcott, is 23, so. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Kara will be around that age. Yeah, Kara should be. Yeah, Kara should be around like. Kara, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> super, damn you, Supergirl. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ka- yeah, Ka- yeah, Kara. Like traditionally, when Kara shows up, she's around 16, 17 years old. Uh, so I could see, I could see, I could see her being anywhere between sixteen to nineteen. Makes sense. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah. That's ex- that's really exciting news. I I'm you know I love the Titans. They're probably my favorite DC team uh, of period. Like 
you know, uh, the the Justice League doesn't have as big of a problem as the Avengers, where like in the comics, the Avengers always kind of sucked up until like the early 2000s when Luke Cage's Avengers came around, when the new Avengers came around with Luke Cage, Wolverine, Spider-Man, you know, all the characters everybody actually likes. Um, but like, you know, I was never really a team book guy growing up, except for the Titans. Because I've always, you know, enjoyed uh, Nightwing as a character. I've fo- I followed him a lot, so, you know, I obviously gravitate towards Titan books. I don't know about you guys, but as far as team book growing up, now granted I didn't collect as much as you guys, but for me personally, I think the only team books that I did pick up, at least DC-wise, were the uh, Titans and uh, the Justice League Unlimited tie-in comic. Oh, I used to read that. I used to read that. Um, much I'm caught. Yeah, I think Titans is my only DC. It was my it was my only major DC uh, team book that I like read regularly. Uh, and then Justice League Dark came out, and then I was, I started reading that. But uh, uh, like the the place where I read my team books was the fucking was Marvel. We got the X Men, the Fantastic Four, you know, shit like that. But yeah, I, I'm I'm hyped for the Titans for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, this is going to probably be the largest segment of the podcast because we have done a lot of media consumption in between podcast episodes. That's right. It uh, is. Uh, oh, yeah. My bad. Sorry. I was just going to let them know because we kind of hinted at it in the introduction. But uh, in recording wise, it's been two weeks. Yep. It has been two weeks. Uh, yeah, so we've we've consumed a lot of media in that time. So we're we're gonna talk about it. Uh, let's talk about the shared stuff first, so we can just kind of knock all that out of the way. Um, so we checked out the first core, aka the first twelve episodes of the brand new Pokemon anime released on Netflix, Pokemon Horizons, and I really fucking like it. Like it's a it it's a you know. New cast, new characters, like a very a unique premise that really lets the world of Pokemon shine through. I really enjoy it. Uh, what about you guys? I love it personally. Yep, such a neat little story. Mm-hmm. I I really enjoy it, and uh, I love that uh, certain aspects about it, like uh, the fact that uh, part of our cast are like actual factual adults. Yeah. Um, and they're competent. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and like the... the each, mm-hmm. I was just saying they each have their own role. Oh, yeah. And like, uh, I think, I mean, and Tony, you, could, you can back me up on this one, uh, you know, if, uh, if, you, if you see where I'm going. I think uh, for, for me, uh, it, lo- it feels like they took a lot of the like small, quieter slice of life moments in Journeys and just made it into more, a more expansive series. And I'm all the I'm all the happier for it. Honestly, my favorite episodes of Journeys were the uh, just kind of one off like character focused episodes. Like man, that episode with the Glaceon, and then the ep- oh the episode with the Cleffa. Oh my God, the episode with the Cleffa. You remember that one, Tony? I remember. Oh, that was that, big sad. Big sad. But yeah, I, I I think I think it does great. And also, this series has the coolest Pikachu to date. The cap Cap is oh. awesome. Cap is the shit. Oh yeah, dude. Love that dude. guy. Like Cap would be happy to know he shares a name with this Pikachu. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the most interesting like characters that has uh touched on a concept that we've talked about that we wanted to see, and that was like someone that was related to the Jenny family. Uh, Joy, yeah, Joy. Jenny's, the, Je- yeah, Jenny's the police officer. Yeah, my bad. All good. Mix it up in my head. But, uh, also would like to see someone that's part of the Jenny family, but for this one, we got Molly, who's part of the Joy family. Mm-hmm. And... Oh, they- and, and also I just realized, also I just realized something, actually. So, it, all their names are Nurse Joy, right? That means Joy is their last name, not first. So, yeah, her name is probably Molly Joy. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. But I also like how they've taken this, like, let's admit it, kind of somewhat crazy, kind of stupid concept. Well, yeah, yeah, the 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 RPG trope of the, you know, r- r- like, uh, duplicate in owner slash, you know, yeah. hospital, uh, hospital attendant. But, but they've managed to take that and, like, turn it into a complex, like, generational trauma, like, what your parents expect from you. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, Molly has a very interesting, almost, like, Encanto-esque arc, 
and uh, characterization. I dig her. Mm -hmm. she's, 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 she's quite a fascinating character. And that's just one of the many characters. Oh, yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so there's that. Um... What other stuff? What other stuff? We watched a bunch. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We're keeping up with the Listen Dungeon, of course. Uh, we want oh Shogun. I don't know why I almost forgot mm -hmm. about this. Holy shit, you guys! So we reacted to the trailer. We already knew it was going to be covered on the show. But my goodness, this show is amazeballs. Mm -hmm. At the time of recording, we have only seen the first four episodes, but. God damn! Right. Like this. This shit is intense. It's got every. It's got everything Game of Thrones fans want. If you're a weep and a Game of Thrones fan, you're doing yourself a disservice by not watching the show. Mhm. Mm because it's it's got it's got fucking political intrigue, sabotage, action, romance, sex, mm -hmm. violence, probably drugs. There's probably gonna be opium involved somewhere in there. It's fucking East Asia. It's uh, crazy. It could be anything. You name it. I'm telling you, this show is intense. Also, just particular shout out to Rodriguez. You're the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, love the show. Well, uh, what you guys want to? Uh, like, you guys want to talk about it briefly? Obviously, we're going to go into more detail in its official episode. But uh, one of our lead characters is a white guy, but they don't do the white savior <laughs> complex. Yeah, he's he's at, if anything, he's he's kind of the white person. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, also, you know, to go back to a show that we reviewed a while ago, uh, the actress who played Kate in Monarch uh, is also a main character in this as well. Mm -hmm. And Tony doesn't hate her this time. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Classic. Uh, but yeah, Shogun was great. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? What else we got? Mm, uh, am I missing anything before I go into the big one? Well, um, I'll go into it more in mine, but I've been watching uh, Game Changers, and, and I've been marathoning it, and I showed these guys one episode. Of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the musical theater one with Mountport. That was hilarious. Loved that. Yeah. He he basically, Sam, the, the host, had three contestants and basically had them make up a musical, like full-on three-act musical on the spot. Yep. That was awesome. Uh, what else is there? Hmm, hmm. I don't, I don't think, oh, well, I mean, I guess for me, like, before I get into the major, what, what took up a, um, a majority of my time and my existence, uh, for the last, like, couple weeks or so, uh, let's, I'll talk about some music briefly. Uh, Ariana Grande's new album dropped relatively recently as of the recording of this podcast. Uh, I enjoy it. Uh, you could tell this was written, uh, while she was still married. Uh, just because of the tone of some of the tracks and some of the themes, still a good, still a good album. Probably not her, not her best, but it wouldn't be in the bottom end of her discography either. It's like towards the middle, around the same area where stuff like Sweetener would be, and I like Sweetener. Um, all right, cool. Uh, what else? Uh, Schoolboy Q's new album, uh, Blue Lips, uh, dropped also recently. Love Schoolboy Q. Uh, now that Kendrick Lamar is out, um, gone from TDE, I feel like now is really uh, Q's time to shine as the top rapper of that collective. And it's one of the best, uh, one of his best pieces of work. He's fucking, he is in shape. His rapping is on point. The production is really solid. I uh, love the album. I, I thought uh, this one was really good. Honestly, I think this will definitely be a, uh, in rotation for a while and probably be within, uh, like, probably at least get a nom for uh, Rap Album of the Year on the uh, for the Grammys next year. I can feel it because uh, this is just a well-made, well-crafted album. Uh, but all right. So, folks, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> the year is 2013. I am but a wee college freshman, and I go and major in psychology. I am fascinated by the human mind and kind of how we tick and work as people because I've always been a people watcher. I've always been observant. I'm a very empathetic person. And plus I can talk my ass off. Uh, so, you know, met all the criteria really. Um, so over time, as I studied psychology as a, as a wee college child, as a wee college kid, I'm no longer a child. I don't know why I said wee child, but as a wee college kid, um, I, I made friends with a bunch of other nerds and uh, some of these nerds uh, were into JRPGs like myself and then they were like hey so there's this one RPG series that's very like very heavily leaning into psychology and stuff like that and yeah uh, and you like mythology and historical shit right it also does that and there's like also kind of a Jojo vibe to it you like Jojo too right you should play this 
and I'm like, okay, cool, what is it? It's called Persona. It's a spin-off of the Shin Megami Tensei series. I was like, oh, cool. I like Shin Megami Tensei. I've played those. And then I tried to get into it, but it was a little overwhelming at the time because all my friends were telling me a bunch of different things. And I was like, all right, what the fuck? How am I, well, how am I supposed to do this? And, you know, one of those friends being our boy Tony here has been trying to convince me to play Persona for, like I said, the last decade since like 2013. Um... And uh, it has finally happened, folks, because uh, Persona 3 Reload uh, came out relatively recently uh, for PC, uh, PS4, PS5, uh, and, you know, all their consoles. Uh, and so I was like, oh, you know, 3, 3 was the, uh, is the game that really started modern Persona. They're doing an updated remake. I should check this out. I've been meaning to get into Persona anyway. Um, I gotta say, everybody was right. I never doubted anyone. I knew I would lo it it was very mu it's very much the case with like uh when Tony uh, tried to was trying to first convince me to play FGO. I knew I would like it. I was just like hesitant I was just hesitant at first because I did I didn't want to spend money. Well, so much for that. But with this, I knew I was going to like it. I just didn't know where to start and I didn't have the time uh in college cuz you know it, college was a lot uh but now i have the time and boy was it worth my time i love this series yo it has everything that i enjoy about jrpgs and probably the thing that like stands out to me the most and that i have the most fun in persona games and i'm sure this is the case for a lot of persona fans is the social system uh, the social links are the reason I play this game. Uh, I think the characters are really interesting and well designed. The different psychological themes are very well presented. Uh, Persona 3 is all about loss and dealing with loss. Uh, Persona 4, I'm just, what, what would you say the theme is for 4, Tony? The theme of 4 is truth and piercing through the fog of lies. All right. Yeah. Seeking the truth. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just so you guys know, I have beat Persona 3 Reload. I've actually beaten it twice. Currently working on a third playthrough as a recording of this podcast to do a max social link uh, run. Um, and uh, yeah, right now I am playing through Persona 4 Golden. Uh, really enjoying it. Uh, as I told Tony before, I think Persona 3 Reload has my favorite story, whereas Persona 4 Golden has my favorite cast of characters. And I think the thing that separates it, uh, separates the two casts that makes me enjoy the uh, Yoshigami High students uh, more so than the uh, Gekukan crew slightly is because uh, with C's, they were more like co-workers at first who eventually became best friends. But like this group, like were friends off bat, you know, uh, Chie, Yukiko, Yosuke, and you, Nara and you, our protagonist, uh, we're all friends. So like it, fe the chemistry feels mo more like instantaneous and natural. Not that C's wasn't. But like I said, it felt more like a like co-workers on a mission at first, whereas like the friendship was immediate from the start with, uh, you know, the the crew of the crew of the investigation team, as it were. Uh, but I really enjoy it. It's fun. Uh, it's eaten all of my free time. And I mean, all of it. Um, <laughs> but like, <Yes. laughs> like in but in the best way possible, because like, man, like, so that's the thing with me in video games. I don't get video games very often because usually if I get really into a video game, I, 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 I become a hermit for at least two to three weeks. Make plans that you don't keep up with. Well, uh, I, I do that without video games. That's just, a, that, that's just the struggle of ADHD. Uh, but yeah, so shit, uh, shit was fun. It's amazing. I'm glad to be part of this fandom. I'm once I'm done with four, I'm probably gonna do a couple TikToks, uh, like regarding my Persona adventure. I have not forgotten about TikTok. I've just, you know, again, been absorbed into this fucking wonderful, crazy world of totally not stands. But <laughs> you know, uh, really enjoyed it. It was fucking awesome. So, you know, once again, shout out to Seto, David, and of course our boy Tony here. You guys were right. Uh, although I never mm -hmm. doubted you. Uh, fucking awesome. Mitsuru is best girl in three. Fight me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make best girl claims yet until I finish four. But right now, Risei is definitely at least my waifu target for my first 
initial run um because i mean he's she's the she's the cute idol girl man i got to i got to um so yeah that's me I, I had a lot of stuff. Uh, we'll move on to Brian, and then we'll end off with Tony. Well, honestly, like I said earlier, I really got in... Well, first of all, uh, <laughs> harp, harping back to uh, what I've been talking about before, I uh, finished Only Murders in the Building Season 2. Really did not see the killer coming. Nope. It was a nice surprise. 1 and 2 are really kind of a package deal, though. I've heard that 3 gets a little anthology-like, so I'll see, but I've been putting that off because it's just so good, I want to stagger it. Oh, yeah. No, I've, 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 done, I've done that with shows I like. And so, in the meantime, I uh, found out that Game Changer is actually currently on it, uh, on the Dropout uh, subscription service. It's actually on its season six right now. So I was like, oh shit, there's a lot that I hadn't seen. So I went back and started marathoning older stuff. It It's really cool. Uh, he does a lot of interesting stuff, like, uh, one of the series that he's done three of now is called Sam Says, where, uh, it's basically Simon Says, but he gets, like, really intense with it. Ah, like in the latest one he immediately says sam says don't flinch and right as he says that a body drops from a uh, body mannequin drops from the ceiling oh i would have lost that immediately i flinched all the goddamn time yep and like uh he'll do things to trip them up like uh one of the ones that i like is uh he says do sam says do something that we will have to censor nice and goes down the line but what he'll do is like with the second and third person he'll say and now you and oh and if they do it yeah clever clever or like he'll have them dance and then he's this is good keep it going and man going. i was i see as a kid nobody wanted to play nobody wanted to let me be simon and simon says because uh if you I mean, anyone who knows me knows that I am very good with words and very good at twisting. So I would often do like trick question type shit with Simon Says. I'd get, I'd get everybody. Mm. I've always oh, wondered yeah. who the Simon Simon Says is named after, though. Just random, random, random thought that Brain wanted to share. Oh yeah. Um, all of season three is the uh, pandemic season mm -hmm. where uh, it was during the pandemic, so it was through webcams. Mm -hmm. and stuff which was really cool uh and they got to do things that they normally wouldn't do like um he brought three of the best people that he knows for that are good actors uh-huh and like had them act like the most ridiculous stuff but like in like he'd give them the emotion to do it with and it wouldn't match oh dang like uh this wasn't one of them but like twinkle twinkle little star like your life depended on it <laughs> stuff like that but, but here's the twist hmm. that I will go ahead and spoil. Uh, after they got used to it, he was like, you know, I love you guys. So I'm going to give you all the points all the time. So I need to give you competition, somebody to act against. So I don't always give you points. And you know who he brought on? Who? I kid you not, Giancarlo Esposito. Oh, that's fucking amazing. Amazing. Oh, uh, uh, man. Uh, real quick, though. Like, uh, you know, the Oscars did pass, and I, I just want to say, fucking, I can't believe this is Nolan's first Oscar. These were for Nolan's first Oscar, or like, I think this was a, a, like his Oppenheimer one was his first, like, f like best picture. Mm -hmm. That's wild to me. Uh, but congrats, congrats, and also we got to give a sh big shout out to Mr. Stark, mm -hmm. RDJ's first Oscar as well. Also, uh, what was what's her name? D. Randolph. Yep. Best supporting actress. Definitely deserved it for uh, the holdovers. Yep, yep. Also, uh, yeah, Hall. for poor things. I really want to see poor things. Uh, it really cleaned up at the Oscars. Um, and uh, what can I call it? Uh, uh, Billy Eilish being the youngest person to win two Grammy. Uh, I, I said Grammys. Uh, Oscars back to back. Yep. And Phineas being the only Glee alum to win two Oscars. Yep. <laughs> uh, good shit. But uh, back to back to Game Changer though. Uh, they also um. Because one of the things is, I've told these guys off camera, but they'll sometimes have something that's really popular as part of Game Changer and they spin off into its own show, like um, Dirty Laundry or Make Some Noise, both of which I've talked about before. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things is um, Make Some Noise, it just started off as a series with just these same three guys over and over. Uh, but when one of them couldn't show up during the pandemic era... 
Keep in mind, this is an impressions game. Mm -hmm. You'll never guess who he got to uh, replace who? for that one particular episode. Who'd you get? Michael Winslow. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Damn. I, I didn't know the fucking college humor bros had so many connections. Apparently. And I found out, um, I found out, uh, I did see the episode where, uh, they got Howie Mandel. I did see what episode that was for. Oh, cool. Uh, it was, uh, quote unquote, not Survivor. Oh, uh, see, uh, uh, I mean, I guess the deal, or deal I guess deal or no deal would be too no, obvious. No, what it was, was because it was a studio, it was a studio, uh, Survivor, where it was all with, contained within the studio, mm. they could only do, uh, so many challenges. So, one of them was, they got this, like, wheeled out this group of, like, instruments and props, and it was like a quick-fire talent competition, and he was like, I cannot judge this, because I love all of you. So, for our special guest judge, I nice. out. That's awesome. So, it was more for Howie's, uh, America's Got Talent side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I watched that. It's great. You guys should check it out sometime out there, people. But, uh, then I, because... For part of this uh, Persona deep dive, I was not part of it, so I've watched a few movies, three of them actually. Um, I watched Glass Onion for the first time. Yep. Really, really great movie. Loved it. The 2020 references were a little, little cringe, but I get it. Um, it's not as good as the first one, but it's still really good. I still really liked it. Then I got to see the Critic Darling from last year. Bottom, great movie. This is the one about the teenage girls that start a, like, fight club. It stars, uh, one of the supporting girls from, um, The Idol. And, uh, current, uh, being raved by critics right now, uh, Ayo Adebiri, uh, from, uh, The Bear. Oh, yep, yep, the, the main chick. Yep. Sydney. Yep, yep, yep. She's one of the lead two. She's great in this. It's a great little coming of age that gets raunchy and uh, it's really good. I really like it. It's it's raunchy and like the raunchy is like sex kind of stuff, but there's never nudity and it does treat because one of the things is uh, both of the uh, leads are lesbians, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool because we don't really get to see too many... I guess queer would be the term. Queer, raunchy, coming-of-age comedies. Yeah. This one is raunchy, but also brutal, because when I say Fight Club, minor spoiler, they actually do start beating the shit out of each other. I mean, <laughs> I, I would say they should. If it, You can't call it a Fight Club if you're just, you know, lightly slapping people. Yeah, you need to throw hands if you're going to be part of a Fight Club. And uh, it's um, it's a um, directed by the same chick who directed the uh, indie darling film Shiva, Shiva Baby. Mm. You ever heard of that? Nope. Uh, it stars the same the same uh, girl who wasn't the girl from the bear. Oh. And uh, it's a coming of age movie about a uh, about a young Jewish girl who's uh, trying who's like down on her luck and trying to discover who she is, but then also. At that same time, trying to survive a shiva with her whole family, which, if you don't know what a shiva is... I was just about to ask. It's basically a wake where everybody stands around with person in the casket, but it's done at a home, and it's done for, like, I think eight plus hours. That's unsettling. Where you just... Well, the whole entire concept is, uh... Everybody brings food. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can understand like the, the the philosophy behind it. You're 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 just with your loved one until they officially transition into the next life and all that. Still, like I don't know, be, be, being being around being around a corpse for a few hours is just I, I, I would be I would be a bit I would I would I mean it's not that I would be scared. It would be more like uneasy, mostly because I believe in ghosts. Oh yeah, and so. I I don't, I don't feel like dealing with that shit because I've already had several experiences like shortly after family mem various family members have passed. So, you know, ghosts seem to like me for some reason. Uh -huh. I mean, like none of, none of my, none of, none of the spirits that I've encountered have been malevolent, thankfully. Most of the time it's just, it's just been like, for example, uh, when my, uh, when my great uncle Remy died, like all, like all, all of a sudden, like. 
the power went out in in our house for, but for like it was only for like five seconds or yeah and then like right then we out uh, like right after the power comes on we get a phone call saying that he passed it's fucking weird bunch of weird shit i could i could go into detail of all my weird supernatural experiences but i might I'm, i might save that for when i turn my life into a tv show probably but uh the last thing i'll say about this is uh there is a name involved with the movie that i think you would know jay okay um the like teacher who is like the teacher who like sponsors it yeah you guys saw the trailer right? yeah yeah mm -hmm. do you know who that is no that is marshawn lynch oh ri the football player yes oh shit and he does a really good job oh shit good pivot he's a funny out of touch teacher nice Man, yeah, so that's awesome. I watched that, and then for something completely different, because I know weird collection of three movies completely different, mm -hmm. I also watched John Wick 2 for the first time. Oh yeah, that's on Peacock, isn't it? Is the third one on Peacock yet? Um, what? Is the third one on Peacock yet? I don't know, but I watched it on Netflix. Oh, it's on Netflix. Ah. Well, part of the reason why I was inspired to watch it is because it's leaving at the end of this month. Ooh. And... The third one is on Netflix. Oh, I want to re. I uh, that one. I want to. I want to rewatch John Wick three. Holy shit! But I really liked it. It felt really bad for John. Two and three kind of blend together for me. Is two the one where Halle Berry shows up? Nope. Okay, that's two three. Is the one where his house burns down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so three, three is a three is a really good one. Halle Berry and fucking Donnie Yen show up. Donnie Yen. I want a movie with just Donnie Yen's character. He's this uh, blind assassin. Fucking sick. Nice. Um, this is the one that uh that uh Common and Ruby Rose play big parts in. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Ruby Rose was the mute girl. Yep. <laughs> which, uh, um, which is really hilarious thinking about it. And you know her Kate Kane. Uh huh. Uh, her best role was when she was mute. That's funny. She's not a bad actress. I know, I, I, I know she's not, but I'm, I'm just saying. I just find it hilarious that like you know the the role that got that probably got her the most attention and like the most buzz to get a superhero gig was the role where she was mute. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you might call it? Uh, this is also the one that introduces Lord Fishburne. Mm -hmm. But. I have a feeling from everything that I've heard that he will play a bigger role. Oh, yeah. Especially with how the movie ends. I would say, oh, yeah. <laughs> because, uh, spoiler alert for a really old movie. Well, not really old, but... Relatively old. Yeah. Um, he loses his membership to the Continental, so he's gonna need all the help he can get. Yep. Yep. Excommunicado. Oh, yep. Also, uh, he owes Lawrence Fishburne... A favor. Yep. So, that was cool. And, uh, I think beyond, uh, the stuff that we all watch together, that's all I've watched. All right, Tony. Mm. I, 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 I actually would like to hear kind of from your perspective what it was like to re-experience the Persona stuff with me. I think well, that, that'll be an interesting, uh, thing for you to, to talk about with your screen time. My first ever Persona game in the series was, uh, Persona 3 Fest for the PS2. I remember those memories of playing that game. I didn't beat it back then because I was a dingus, but I I was able to beat 3 eventually. And then after that, I just played through Golden, put so many hours into P4 Golden that it's ridiculous. I've actually looked at the file on the Vita. He is not kidding. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to 5 and then Royal, I had a lot of fun playing through many hours of that game. But seeing Jay play through Reload with a uh, bit of my nostalgia and the new things that they added in into Reload, maybe just kind of reinvigorate my love for the series again while waiting for 6 to come out. Mm -hmm. And from what I've heard, will be potentially next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But just seeing Jay play through the series that I've been trying to get him into for years, it seems like I have to be the one that really convinces this man to get into things that I feel like. Take that, it David. Just has but it got me to want to play through a uh, Persona 5 spinoff that I've had and that I've neglected to beat. That being Persona 5 Strikers, which is the Muso game of the series. And it's so fun. It's actually quite enjoyable. Nice. And then I went down my usual rabbit hole again of looking into uh, some Persona related stuff. And I found this uh, YouTube channel that focuses on a lot of Mega Ten stuff. It's called, uh, the channel is known as Stain42. 
he oh. focused. Yep. Mm -hmm. He focused on a lot of Megaton stuff. He's famous for the Demon Compendium, yeah. where he basically talks about the origins of the Megaton demons that are used with the entirety of the franchise. Mm -hmm. and uh, yep. Lens and Persona as well. Yep. I've yeah. I've actually seen the Demon Compendium videos. Yep. They're ninety three of those things. Yeah. That chunky ass playlist. Mm -hmm. Very chunky. And one of the things that he has been doing. Uh, of every month or so at his own admission to sparse degrees. He talks about the ultimate and initial personas of every member of the cast of each of the mainline game. That includes the, since Persona 2 is a duology, that includes the adult cast of Eternal Punishment. Mm. So he rate the design elements more so. Ah, okay. So he talks about both the initial, in, he talks about the initials in one video for every party member. And then the next video would be for that particular game. Mm. And his most recent one is for the ultimate personas of Persona 3's cast. Oh, cool. I'll have to check that out since, you know, I've, three, uh, I've finished three recently. Mm -hmm. he, uh, his most famous top 10 list is actually his least favorite persona. Interesting. And, well, one of my personal favorites is that particular uh, video is because one of the initial personas of the p3 cast was initially his least favorite persona in the series but now that was changed because of a different design that he just doesn't stand for oh uh, okay so which one from three which it which is it the initial persona that he did not like the design of was nemesis nemesis Ken's. nemesis yeah nemesis doesn't have that interesting of a design yeah so neither does he, his uh neither does his ultimate persona actually uh i, I can never pronounce it it's kali nemi kali nemi there you go it's actually a uh, hindu in origin mm. but he fe he realized that a different persona's design was a lot worse okay. in comparison nemesis okay the initial placing from he put nemesis as at least his third mm -hmm. but you want to know what his least favorite persona is in the oh. entire franchise all right shoot is it one that i know is one that you don't know oh okay it's from persona one. Oh, so shin megami tensei if no actual inrenboku persona oh okay so okay the first ever persona game in the series so uh. persona one okay not if persona one <laughs> uh, every, uh, see every video i watch keeps saying that the, fir the first game is Shin Megami Tensei is. No, it is not. Okay. That's a different story. It's its own. It spun off from it. Okay. But anyways, so what's the what's the persona? Freya. Oh, so Freya's brother. Yep. Freya's brother is just a dude with a stick. Dang. That's lame. And you know what's worse about that? Hmm. It's the ultimate persona of Yuka Ayase, the representative of the Magician Arcana. Dang. Which... Homegirl is a, she's a Garu, oh. who uh, is actually very sweet. Oh, man. So her whole goal in life is just to live a regular life after the events of the Snow Queen quest. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I, I highly recommend the folks at home who are Persona fans to really look into this channel and a few others to just get an idea of everything Mega Ten. And I'm going to reiterate this for those of who are fans of the Persona series. Yes, it's spun off from Mega Ten from If, but now Persona is its own separate facet in the Megami Tensei multiverse. Uh, yes, because oh, because it is a multiverse. It gets very complicated with timelines, alternate timelines, and uh, deleted dimensions. Oh. Uh, with, but the one thing I could say is that it is overall consistent. Oh yeah. With Oh, the eternal logic. Oh yeah, with each individual uh, story in the overall world that's, building. That's the that's what I that's what I really love about Mega Ten as a franchise is that like you know they keep building up the lore, but like also the lore still makes sense. It's very fate esque in a way. Mm -hmm. Very um, much so. On top of that, and I will make this very brief, as brief as I can, even understanding a lot of the characteristics can kind of give you a bit of an idea of what they may go for with Persona 6, because mm -hmm. we already know what color. Yep. That being green. Yeah, that'll be interesting. 
Um, also, uh, real quick, I'm just, I'm super excited because this summer, because I've been waiting for this for a while, because it was only on the Switch and I refused to play it on my Switch because I wanted a bigger screen. Uh, finally, this summer, uh, SMT5 is going to be on Steam, so I'll nice. finally get to play SMT5. Very excited. Yeah, I've been actually been meaning to get into mainline Mega 10 for myself. Uh, you could prob you could probably start with Nocturne. That's what I, that's what I was told by my stepbrother actually. Yeah, but you Deep turn. Yeah, Nocturne Nocturne's a good starting point because it's 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 basically to in Persona terms, it's the Persona 3 of Mega 10. Yeah. Where it. where yeah, where where it introduces a lot of the mechanics that are like integral to modern Mega 10. Yeah, it came out during the around the same general timeline as P3 as well. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, cuz it came out on the same console the the uh, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played Nocturne on PS2, which is funny because I had no I like you know I played Shin Megami Tensei because my dad did. I had no idea that like you know Persona was even a thing that was going on. Mm -hmm. hmm. But yeah, I mean, just so we're clear, the only uh, mainline game of Persona that we got was Revelations Persona initially for the PS1, and that localization was problematic at best. But yeah, Shin Megami Tensei was one of those ones because, like, as a kid, obviously my mom would not buy rated M games for me. But, you know, my dad would still want to play some of these games. And so, like, I got to play shit like Devil May Cry, the Onimusha series, um, shit like the God, of, the God of War series. All because, you know, my dad would play it first, and then I'd get to play them. That's actually how I got into Metal Gear as well, but I sucked at Metal Gear because I, I, I can't do stealth. I'm too I'm too theatrical. I don't like I don't like sitting around being sneaky. It's not fun. You you can't be sneak. Nope. But yeah, okay. So that was screen time. Told you guys this was gonna be a hefty segment. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. But now we're going to transition, hopefully if Brian is still here, uh into trailer talk. Trailer talk is the segment of the podcast where our boy Brian here has gathered together six count them six brand new as of the recording of this podcast episode trailers yeah. for us to react to uh so we will uh go ahead and check these trailers out he has provided a playlist for you guys down below in the description so be sure to check that out and uh through the magic of editing we shall return in a few seconds to give you our rapid fire thoughts on these trailers until then please enjoy this word from our non-existent sponsors and we're back okay this batch of trailers was great i enjoyed all of them uh i'm apprehensive towards one but that's because i don't trust new star wars and you know i i, I will reserve any judgment until i uh, the, the premiere actually happens so i'm not really going to comment yeah. on the acolyte all that much let's just start with that one okay all right yeah. mm -hmm. at least the trailer looked yeah, I mean, mo most of, you know, Disney knows how to cut a good trailer. Um, and I mean, like, oh, like I said to the guys while we were like watching the trailers, it doesn't even look, it doesn't look like Star Wars. It feels more like Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, which isn't a bad thing because I think Rebel Moon is pretty awesome. But like, also, Rebel Moon was originally a Star Wars movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it makes, so it makes sense. But uh, at least uh, it's good to see a uh, another Wookiee who isn't Chewy. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 inter I'm also, interested to see uh like what's going on here. It looks like our lead is the apprentice, the uh, dark side apprentice. Yeah, the dark acolyte. Hence why it's called the acolyte. Uh, Alexandra Shit, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. Is their name. Yep. Uh, Rue from uh. Hunger Games. Yeah. Hunger Games. Yeah. <laughs> She's all grown up. Yep. I believe I also, I I think. Was it was it her that was in the movie The Hate You Give? No, I don't think that. I don't think that. Maybe I don't think that was her. But that was a. I don't know. Uh, but for some reason, I thought of that movie. And that was a good movie. Um. Anyways. Uh. Yeah. Apprehensive. I'll see. Could. Um, mm -hmm. I was just also gonna say credit to uh to uh um credit to uh um, Gion's actor because it looks like he he was the one speaking in the trailer and if he hadn't spoken English before then yeah I was gonna say I was just about to ask like has he spoken English before because like if this was his first time what the fuck English is a very hard language because English is fucking weird yeah um and it is a uh I don't know if this is his first time speaking English but I know it's his first time in English production yeah yeah mm -hmm. and you know also, you were right Jay mm-hmm she was in the hate you give. Yep. But it's also because I said the wrong actress's name. Oh. It's a um, Mandela Steinberg. 
There you go. I I knew she was Rue from the Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, I'm pretty sure Rue from the Hunger Games was in the Hate You Give with fucking KJ Apa. Good movie. I I totally forgot that she was in um the Sleepy Hollow TV show. Yep. And uh, she was in the um, film version of uh, Dear Evan Hansen. Unfortunately for her. Oh, shit. And that's right. She's also Spider-Bite in Across the Spider-Verse. Yep. Very talented actress. Uh, but we'll see. Moving on. Uh-huh. I guess. Yep. So uh, the next one, let's talk about uh, the Nicolas Cage one. Uh, Arcadia. Mm -hmm. That shit looks fucking dope. It's very interesting. It feels kind of, it feels very classic, like, claustrophobic monster movie survival kind of thing. Actually, it feels very slasher-esque. Um, yeah, it's very monster movie-like. I enjoy it for that. Mm -hmm. And it looks mm -hmm. like it's like, it's, it's, yeah, like, and this isn't an insult. It looks like a B-movie and it feels like it's really embracing being a B-movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really dig that. Uh, don't know what the hell they are. Yeah, but I'm definitely intrigued. Uh, speaking also, of other horror see, shit. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, cool to see a uh, single father horror movie, because usually it's the single mother. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah. good a good dads have been making a good, uh, like, a huge comeback in cinema, like, or just media in general, you know, <laughs> carried on the back of Pedro Pascal, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Um, but well, yeah. yeah, the other horror movie. Holy shit! Uh, Late Night with the Devil. That mm. looks amazing. It does. So good. Very intense. Very suspenseful. It it looks awesome. Mm -hmm. David Dismelchin. Yep. Finally getting his time to shine. Yeah, he finally isn't just an extra or, you know, somebody or like a small bit character. Uh, so David Dismolchin, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, like he started he started his career for, uh, prolifically as an extra. And uh, one of the places he uh, was one of the biggest movies he was an extra in was uh, Dark Knight. I believe he was one of uh, Joker's goons in the bank robbery scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that that's cool. Um, and of course, most people nowadays know him as, um, you know, one of Scott's crew that, you know, Scott totally forgot about. Mm -hmm. Not going to let that go. Um, or also returning back to DC to play Polka Dot Man. Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did play Pokemon, the, the Polka Dot Man in the Suicide Squad. It was great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's going to be awesome. Uh, I, I, I really want to see this movie. It looks dope. Dope as hell. Indeed. Um, speaking of stuff that looks dope as hell, The Crow. Holy, Ooh. holy shit. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. Tony mentioned it, but fucking Skarsgård got jacked. Mm -hmm. Like, dude is in superhero shape oh, for real. Definitely. And on top of that, personally for me, not to put words into the rest of the panel here, I agree with a lot of the sentiment that the uh, overall... Uh, comic book fandom has and it's uh not the best of just oh yeah i i agree it's really, mm -hmm. uh a letter joker leto joker-esque yeah it gives that it gives that vibe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i'm okay with it seeing it in uh in actual motion yeah it fits this version of uh eric yeah and i think uh, i think what it is right and because like this is just kind of the trope of superhero origin movies and marvel netflix kind of super perpetuated that unfortunately mm -hmm. i think it's one it's gonna be one of those situations where like as we saw in the trailer he's like he starts to put on the makeup i think he'll be in the full crow costume like comic accurate costume for like the first the last five minutes of the movie or something like that or maybe even the last shot um but yeah like i agree it gives off a, a bit of a weird vibe uh it's a little little too minimalist uh minimalist for my taste but the performance from Skarsgård sold me on him as the character so i don't mind oh, yeah, if the costume a, is lackluster it's a tour de force awesome. in all honesty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also the effect oh yeah so, you know, definitely looking forward to that when it comes this summer, you know, slash coming soon. This summer. Whatever happened to that guy. Uh, anyways, um, so what what uh, are we missing? We're missing one. Yep. Um, we're missing, I think, a couple. Uh, one of them. Oh, no. Yeah, we're missing two. Oh, right, 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 right. right. Supercell. Yeah, Supercell. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Which, um, trailer doesn't really go into it too much. Yeah. But, uh, it's about a group of people 
the main one being Brian from uh, Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, seemingly ordinary people from South London unexpectedly develop superpowers. They don't seem to have a connection between them aside from one. They're all black. Yep. Yeah. So, but, so, so, so the funny thing is, like, uh, I, I heard, I, I, I think, I, I wonder if this is ba like, the uh, concept for this is based off of that meme for the eclipse. Mm -hmm. You remember? <laughs> oh. That's the day black people are going to get their superpowers. Oh, man. I remember that. Oh. Um, I wonder if that's what inspired the concept. I don't know, but it's a, it's a created by uh, the guy known as the stage name Rap Man. Oh. But yeah, it, rapper. It, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I never, I haven't really listened to much UK hip hop. Um, I only, I, I only know a few uh, drill artists. He sang in um, Jay Z's Rock Nation. You mean he was signed to Rock Nation? Uh, yeah, signed. Sorry. Oh. Back. Ah. Uh. Read it wrong. Okay, interesting. Uh. But, uh, but yeah, it it looks interesting. Yeah. No, the uh, time travel thing. Yeah, uh, it it feels like yeah, it it, it uh his uh the main dude uh, Ryan from Doctor Who's power set reminds me of uh Homeboy from the Misfits with the time travel powers. Oh yeah, that was some I, wild. Shit. I fucking loved that show, by the way. Oh, Misfits, oh, yeah. awesome. So, uh, and fun fact, mm -hmm. you know who played that kid with the time travel powers, right? Yeah, Bolton. Yeah. It it was Ramsey. Yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> oh, no. I, I remember. Yeah, he, yeah. Ramsey did Ramsey have the time travel. The time traveler. Oh, it wasn't. Oh, was it the black guy? He was the invisible dude. Right. No. No. Yeah, no. Because the time traveler dude was the black guy. I do. I remember this. Uh, yes. Okay. True. But I remember distinctly that there was a plot with a future version of himself going back in time. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. they they swap their yeah cause, yeah because their powers evolved because like and like Antonia Thomas's character ended up having different powers besides her like insta horny yeah his thing later sent back in time yep yep. Mm. Yeah. So that's the funny thing is when you say time traveler with that show, there was more than one, so I got confused. Now, understandable, yeah. understandable. This, this gets funky fresh, uh, as, oh. especially like the last couple seasons is pretty wild. But yeah, overall looks cool. Uh, I'm definitely interested. And then mm -hmm. the last one was. Uh, yeah, uh, the the idea of you. Um, yep. Yeah, the uh, Anne Hathaway movie uh, based off of the One Direction fanfic. It looks cute. And I gotta say, Anne Hathaway looks great. Like, By itself. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, I actually uh, heard something interesting about the movie. Hmm. So apparently, um, when they were making it and they decided to make it, they immediately signed on Anne Hathaway. Oh. Uh, but uh, then they, uh, they had, like, open auditions for... The Harry Styles. The Mm -hmm. And they actually had Anne Hathaway there to do a chemistry test. Oh, yeah, it's a chemistry test. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And also, other fun fact, mm -hmm. this movie is directed by Michael Showalter. Name sounds familiar, but I'm it's not registering. Uh, He's directed films you may have heard of. Um, Well, he didn't direct it, but he wrote it and produced it. Wet Hot American Summer. Nice. Uh, he did direct, uh, The Big Sick. I like The Big Sick, the Camille Nanjiani movie. That was good. Yep. Uh, and speaking about Camille Nanjiani, The Lovebirds. Oh, the Issa Rae one. Yep. That was fun. He directed that one, too. Okay. Yeah, so he makes good rom-coms. He, he directed, uh, Spoiler Alert, which was the, uh, the one with, um, Jim Parsons. Ah. Uh. Where it was the gay rom-com about meeting the family and all that. Mm-mm-mm. And he's also worked on a ton of TV shows, um, like Wet Hot American Summer, Gracie and Frankie. Gracie and Frankie is really good. But yeah, so. Uh, but yeah. Guy behind the camera. Uh, I will be cool to see this movie. Oh yeah, I I, I think yeah, I, I think it'll be a fun watch. Who knows? Uh, I think good chance that uh some of these, not all of them, but some of these have a good chance of being possible show candidates. Oh yeah, for sure. But all right. So, with trailer talk done, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the main discussion of uh, this week, and that is, of course, Damsel, starring Millie Robbie Brown over on Netflix. So, uh, the spoiler-free section, we're just going to, you know, tell you what the movie's about, uh, what we liked about it, and then we'll go into more depth in the spoiler section. So, this is, this first part's going to be super short. Um, 
let's just kind of speak in general. Um, so like Brian mentioned, uh, this was like a a, a last second choice because we were like, we still want we still want to do an episode, but like I I've, I've been so I've been so absorbed into Persona, I don't know if I could get through a whole TV show. And so Brian was like, okay, let's I'll look for a movie, and you know. Brian did his thing. He went searching, and uh, he found. Uh, he, uh, I I remember seeing uh, the on the like homepage of Netflix that uh, like Damsel had popped up there, and he was like, "Oh yeah, it came out." And then Brian had mentioned that it came out to mixed reviews and whatever. Um, and we were like, "Ah, okay, you know." So uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, approach it cautiously, but you know, every time we watch a movie that you know, quote unquote, has mixed reviews or is just okay, it turns out we actually really like the movie. Mm -hmm. and uh it's becoming a trend uh not completely with the podcast but uh stuff like uh shazam 2 blue beetle yep to a lesser extent aquaman 2 yeah um but yeah um it's essentially a uh, fantasy movie about a young princess who is thrown into circumstances in which she has to fight off against a fierce dragon. Uh, and that's all I, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. To say more would be to spoil. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's all, that's all I can, that's all I can really say. Uh, the other, what I can't, the stuff I can say is, uh, like it is, it's very much, uh, for a good chunk of the movie, it's very much like a, like a, a suspense thriller. It feels like a horror film mm -hmm. where like the monster is constantly lurking uh, down every, like around every corner, which it is because it's a big fucking dragon. Um, and so you get a lot of that suspense, a lot of that like survival horror type stuff. Um, you know, uh, LOD, our main character, like, you know, MacGyvering the shit out of stuff to, you know, kind of figure her way out like learning about the environment she's in so that she can survive against this big fuck off dragon mm -hmm. uh, it's, mm -hmm. i was just gonna say they really lead into the suspense and action for this mm -hmm. which makes sense because uh i just googled it it's uh the same director as 28 weeks later oh yep yeah, see that makes sense also a little bit of fun fact for you according to imdb on uh, his next movie that he has in the works Mm -hmm. It is a uh, Disney live action adaptation. Okay. But after seeing Damsel, I kind of trust him. Okay. Because Sword in the Stone? The movie it is Sword in the Stone. Yeah, I was going to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a feeling that's where you were leading. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But yeah, you can see the like 28 weeks later stuff in this movie. Uh, yeah. And uh, like, I, I love the set design. Uh, it's freaking beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. And like, we'll go into more detail, but the particular design of the dragon is great. Oh, yeah. Um, Indeed. And also with the, the sets are great. Mm -hmm. But the sets are also great for the fact of like sharing this wide brawling world because without getting into spoilers, we do see where she was born. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a like... Wish.com Winterfell. Yep. Wish.com Winterfell. <laughs> but, but then but then when we see the actual like kingdom and everything, it's more classic fairy tale. It reminded me of like this is gonna be a funny but I feel apt comparison. It reminded me of when you went from Shrek Swamp in Shrek 2 to Far Far Away oh, yeah. in Shrek 2. Yeah. A more yeah. serious version. Yep. And the CGI that they use for the castle is not glaringly bad. Although I'm not gonna lie, uh, Simon from Love Simon, whatever his act, I forget the actor's name off the top of my head. He actually kind of looked like a little bit like Prince Charming from Shrek 2, just with the haircut. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick Robinson. Nick Robinson. Thank you. Um. Also, uh, Robin Wright does an awesome job as the queen. Mm -hmm. And uh, same goes for uh, Angela Bassett as the step yeah the stepmother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty sick. Um, yeah, she she did it. She did a great job. Uh, the action scenes are pretty fucking dope. Uh, Millie does Millie does a good job in them. I don't know if she actually did all the uh, all the stunt work, but like she looks to be in shape for it. So I'm gonna say she probably did at least some of it. Yeah, probably. Uh, but yeah. So uh, if you like high fantasy, uh, susp um, suspense. Well, it's not really high high fantasy, but if you like fantasy, uh, suspense, action, a more like kind of self-contained claustrophobic adventure uh i definitely uh suggest yeah. checking out damsel i was telling the guys mm -hmm. when we were watching it 
but it felt kind of like more along the lines of those like uh, surviving natural disaster type movies. Well, yeah, 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 could definitely because the dragon was definitely felt more like a force of nature, mm -hmm. way more than anything in any Roland Emmerich film. <laughs> Those movies, dude, lame as shit. <laughs> uh, look, I will shit on Roland Emmerich any opportunity I get to shit on Roland Emmerich. I I, I hate that guy. Hey. I just move. I hate that guy's movies, except for Independence uh, Day. Yeah. Independence Day is dope. Let me let me take any fear you might have and make it into a big CGI fest disaster movie. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Or uh, or perpetuate a fucking lie. Yep. Oh yeah. No, that's with all of them. Yep. Like the mind calendar shit. Uh huh. No, no, no. The one that I personally found the most egregious. Yeah? Which one? The whole historical conspiracy theory that fucking Shakespeare isn't real. Oh, yeah, that was him, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that was, was him, wasn't it? Damn, you're right. We're Fuck all the way off, Emmerich. Fuck. Drama movie, but still... I remember that. ...input his disaster stuff into it. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a disaster movie because <laughs> it was a disaster of a movie. Yeah. No, yeah. Tony's right. And also, uh, if you remember the global warming movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, the day tomorrow. after tomorrow. Yeah. So many times it terrified me, but Emmerich can fuck off with that too. Oh, you man. scarred my childhood with that, you bastard. Fuck you. Oh, and you have the audacity, <laughs> the gall to ruin one of the goats of kaiju films. Fucking Godzilla. Yeah, that was you, you <laughs> asshole. That's a lot of fish. Oh, oh. You can die man. all with that shit, you bastard. Man. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I miss this. I missed pressing the button. Uh, uh, uh. I will give you one quality thing. Because you actually did something amazing. Independence Day. Independence. Yeah, Independence Day is, a Independence Day is your only good film in your repertoire, Emmerich. Yeah, you should have stopped with that. that. Kind of you are. With, yeah. Didn't he also do the sequel? Did he? Probably. I could see it. Better not have. But, uh, but yeah. So, fucking... Yep. Roland yep. Emmerich. Roland Emmerich rant aside, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into the uh, spoiler section now. So if you haven't I, seen I, Damsel, if you haven't seen Damsel or any of the Roland Emmerich films, <laughs> uh, do yourself a favor, avoid the Roland Emmerich films. Besides Independence Day, it, Independence Day is fucking awesome. Um, and uh, you know, bounce out. We appreciate you. Uh, come back after you've seen the movie. And let us know what you thought. All right, let's go. Uh, we're just gonna skip the countdown and just jump straight into the discussion. Uh, shit. holy shit. Uh, one of the things that I, I really like about this movie is that, like, uh, and I, and, you know, I commented on it while, as you were watching it, but, like, a lot of stuff happened, but, like, the movie also, it never drags, right? No. Shit was moving a mile a minute after we got into, the, like, once she got, like, yeeted off the mountain. Mm-hmm. Like, to the point where... Uh, we had to look and uh, we were like, we're only halfway through. Right? And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we, I, yeah. yeah. How long is this movie? Yeah. Yeah. Tony was like, how long is this movie? And it's like, uh, you know, probably not that long. We're probably not that far into it. Oh shit. We're halfway through. What the fuck? Yeah. No, it was wild. But yeah. Uh, even mm -hmm. that. Even that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was already a thing. Like the second act was already going fast and all of that. Yeah. Then the third act, they like yeah no yeah no they kick they kicked it into overdrive um so like there isn't really much to like say about like the plot uh all that much like it's kind of your standard fantasy like you know princess has to marry for uh, political alliances and the betterment of the kingdom stuff like that you've seen it a bajillion times I don't need to like you know go over that in depth um but like the big twist is that like the marriage uh like that the that this particular kingdom brokers uh is all a ploy to get fodder for a sacrificial uh, to a sacrifice ritual to a big fuck off dragon Mm -hmm. Where they and essentially and won't kill the royal yeah line. royal family and like the super fuck thing is that they lie they base they lie to the bride and just you know chuck them to their death mm -hmm. like uh like the one thing I will uh, like I'll give credit is that like you know uh the prince he de like he wasn't into it his mom his mom was forcing his hand but at the same time you're a grown man you could definitely just tell your mom no the thing that I like about the movie is particularly his character. Mm -hmm. 
was very gray. Yeah, because he genuinely, I think, was forming a, like, real relationship with Elodie. And they were actually really cute. Yeah. Um. It was wholesome until it wasn't. Yep. And then, like... I also really respect, like, while well, everybody else is, like, freaking the fuck out when, uh, like, the late- the mama dragon is going all fucking Drogon on this kingdom, uh, like, while everybody else is freaking the fuck out, uh, the prince is just like, nah, you know what? I deserve this. We all deserve it. Fuck it. Go ahead. You got it, chief. Yeah. I accept my fate. Yeah, I respect that. I respect that about his character. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I, I've, and also, you know, uh, the, I like what this movie does with the, uh, with the stepmother trope because, like, you know, very early on, I, I, like, uh, you know, I commented to the guys, I was like, you know, I've always found the evil stepmother, like, stereotype really weird because every person that i know that i'm friends with who uh like whose parents got divorced like has a really great relationship with their step parents like yeah so uh, if it's media usually step parents are either portrayed as evil or it's the stuff that we can't talk about on podcast yep bow, bow. Uh, i was more doing the porn hub sound effect but yeah uh um so yeah like i'm just also gonna say that uh, you talk about complex characters in the way that they did it the stepmom but also the dad mm -hmm. and uh like mm -hmm. and and the, the thing that the thing that i like and uh, like you know that they put they put it in a little bit of dialogue so it's very quick to miss is that like you know her stepmother isn't wasn't just some like gold digging like social climber like you would expect in like a fairy tale uh mm -hmm. from the dialogue that she had with the queen of the other kingdom like she was just like a she just sold rope you know and then like i i believe genuinely fell in love like genuinely fell in love with the king uh you know and after his after his wife passed uh he wasn't a, he was a uh he was a baron ah baron baron yeah okay the baron yeah Gotcha. But yeah, I think, yeah, like, you know, they, they genuinely fell in love. It wasn't just a, like, you know, power grab for her. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and like, I, I, I like, I like also that she had kind of a, like, a little rags to riches story. So, like, it's why she cares so much about the kingdom because, you know, she feels like, she feels like, because, you know, her husband, you know, dedicated so much of himself to the, the kingdom or, you know, their little you... village area. Yeah. Because part of the reason why they were, is the king, at the, Baron, you got me now doing it. The Baron was initially going to do this was because his people ran out of money. Yeah, and they were starving, and winter yeah. and, and winter was coming. <laughs> Had to do it. Oh, probably won't be the last time. But uh, yeah, and I like his character because it's kind of like um a complete inverse of uh the queen. Listen, because... I'm a I'm gonna I'm gonna keep making these comparisons for for some reason tonight, but they're just at the the dad's arc in this movie is essentially a more actiony version of Fiona's dad's arc in Shrek Two. <laughs> Technically, yeah, you're right. <laughs> See? <laughs> minus, minus the whole frog. Thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, like I said, yeah, uh, yeah, minus the frog thing. But like I said, a more action new version of mm -hmm. Fiona's dad's arc. But I do like that where he was like, because we find out basically, they never actually say it, but you read it between the lines. The reason why he was being so gruff and so adversarial in the beginning was just because he was trying to distance himself from... From his, his daughter, daughter, so that so that it wouldn't hurt that she, he just you know threw her to the slaughter. Yeah, Which yeah. Later down the line, was rather impossible for him to do because he honest he honestly did love his daughter to the extent he would fight a fucking dragon for her. Yeah, and yeah. like he went out like a fucking G, and like mm -hmm. the the like his final moments where he goes, you know, LD, I am your father. Do you hear me? And I order you, do not come out. And that crushes him like a fucking peanut. Yo, it and the sound design. Ugh. Oh, gross. So good. Oh yeah. But what one thing I can for is my apologies there, Brian. But one thing I want to say is I love that the parental relationships in this movie are very they're examined so closely with a fine tooth comb. That mm -hmm. you can the overall decisions that a lot of these parents have made mm -hmm. in the moments, like uh, Elodie's dad, the Baron, doing what he did to like save his daughter from imminent death, even though he didn't know if his daughter was even alive. Yep, that is dedication. That's a father, right? And, yeah, there. and that's real. That's that's real love. He's like 
he did uh you know all all his people and the mercenaries he hired were like you know she it's been like days sir i'm, I'm pretty sure she's dead and he's, he's like no that's my daughter's resourceful she'll figure it out and you know he, he was, was not wrong he was fucking right and uh and also to kind of go back to the stepmom we we were at a moment where like it's kind of cliche for like both parents to die so when we saw uh stepmom get shanked i was like oh shit she's dead yep <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. We, me and Tony both sure. thought she was dead, but then Brian, Brian, be having, uh, you know, being more like logic minded, we were, we were absorbed into the movie. But Brian was like, no, 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 no. Think about it though. That's Angela Bassett. They're gonna kill her. It's gonna be some kind of grand scene. Like they wouldn't just well, casual the shank. Yeah. Was they walked in, grabbed the daughter, shanked her, and left. Yeah. Well, you would also have to, you would be bleeding out at that point. I was thinking at it logically. Yeah, yeah. For those yeah, things. same. Like, like, look, man, you get shanked in, especially in the All, stomach Yeah, I, area. I was going to say, that was, that, that was the other, re that was the other reason I really thought she was dead. Because, like, one of the worst places to get shot or stabbed is the stomach. Mm -hmm. And she got stabbed in the stomach. Or at least that general region. Like the... it's one of the is one of the few negatives about the movie because yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I but, but I mean, I'm glad she's alive. It's a minor nitpick thing, so it it's fine. Yeah, it doesn't really take away anything from the movie, to be honest. But by, like the most dynamic, like I think the overall theme for this movie is how parenthood is portrayed and how there yeah, are how yeah, how something. parents will do anything for their children. Yeah, so it's more like it's it's the actions of parents that doom children throughout the course of generations. Yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's a message of like you know, uh, you know, to to relate it to to our generation, like how you know we inherited a really fucked up world because of all the fucked up decisions from you know previous generations, and mm -hmm. you know that that under the message here is like you know, um, a lot of the parents that are viewed here kind of leave their kids to clean up their mess, like you know, uh, Elodie's dad yeah. in Elodie. Uh, in Elodie's case, she has to slay the dragon after he dies. Um, you know, in uh, the prince in the in the case of the One Kingdom, uh, the the ancient king, uh, due to his greed and um, you know lust for power, uh, sacrif uh, was willing to sacrifice his own children in order to keep himself and his kingdom alive. Also, because he fucked up, because mm -hmm. he was, uh, it wouldn't be xenophobic. What would you call it? What? Uh, he's a, you'd be a, he's a, he's a speciesist, I guess. Yeah, he's a species. You talking about? He yeah. Said, yeah, he just, he thought the dragons would be a real threat or it, a way to accumulate wealth for himself and renown. So he kill wanted to kill a dragon. But the easiest prey that he did to think to starve the dragon out is to kill its young. Yep. Which he saw, which he did. So the dragon that we see in the film is lived a very long life yep she's with, a she's a heartbroken mother with nothing to lose and vengeance on her mind and like also just the treachery of this kingdom how they fucking loot pull I, I gotta give it to them though it's fucking clever how they fucking loophole the system where they you know they agree they they, they settled on this truce and agreement with with the dragon mother um uh, but like, I will, will sacrifice our royal daughters to you, you know, e every generation. But how they do it is like, you know, they don't actually send their blood daughters. Yeah, so the, they get... Yeah, the, they get the girls married. Mm -hmm. Descendant mm -hmm. of this line. And then just toss his brides by mixing their blood with mm -hmm. a blood oath ritual of sorts. Yep. Which you think kind of fail at from the start because yeah. the scent of blood would still be there but wouldn't really be yeah. blood itself how, yeah. Yeah. how would that that's that was the other thing that was really kind of driving me nuts was like all right uh -huh. so like I, and i don't want to pull on this thread too hard but like one of the yeah. one of the things that was bothering me throughout the movie was like okay hold on hold on hold on so they so they have the wedding ritual or cut open the hand mix the blood with really lewd you know unnecessary hand holding right disgusting but anyways uh and then they eat the woman the women off the mountain 
And the dragon says, you know, she could smell the blood of her aggressor in in the in the woman and in, in, you know in this case Elodie but like it's not like they injected the blood into the woman's body right so like I'm pretty sure the dragon could tell the difference I mean you could make yeah. the you could make the excuse of blinded by rage and all that so like you know we can just write that off but like it it, it, it bugged me I'm not gonna lie, it bugged because I was like, that doesn't really make any sense. Mm -hmm. They also kind of hinted at the fact that uh, there was only one other person besides Elodie who made it beyond the cave. Uh, and like most of the women die very early, so before the dragon can even think about it. Yeah. That's true, yeah. Yeah. And like you said, the dragon mother was blinded by rage and distraught mm -hmm. over the death of children that she has kind of ruminated on the death of her children for hundreds and hundreds of years well, also to the fact where uh if you remember at the end of the movie when elodie shows the cut and says that they forced it and that they lied the dragon's first instinct is that all humans deserve to die yeah which you know understandable given her circumstances uh mm -hmm. But yeah, I also do like that, like, you know, one of the big things, like, yes, it was an action movie, but also it was, uh, it was a movie about communication and, like, acknowledging the truth, kind of, like, tying back a little bit to the earlier Persona 4 conversation, uh, and I, it, it was just really cool to just, you know, yeah, we had our, like, Millie Bobby Brown action warrior moments, but I think the best parts for me were, was when she got to just kind of monologue and, like, you know, explain, like, bring the dragon to her side with her words and not her blade yeah i love mm -hmm. that the final fight wasn't really a fight yeah and i i ju i just love i my favorite part was when she rocks up right in her like you know makeshift battle dress and like you know mm -hmm. the queen the queen of the kingdom like you know is talking all this big shit and it's like what do you think you can do you can't do anything and she's like yeah i know i can't and then she's kind of just the but she can kind of thing and the, the, they look up at this guy and the fucking like I said, the fucking dragon mother goes full Drogon on those bitches. Yeah, but also the, like, boss moment right before that, right before the mm -hmm. dragon arrives, where it's like, she looks at the crowd of ongoers and she's like, any of y'all that are innocent that want to run, now would be your time. I'm telling you now, if you don't want to die, run. And I also like that, like, you know, she exposes the, like, the tradition right off bat. And she's like, take your family, go to the, to the, uh, you know, the bride to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was dope. Um, I, I, and, you know, and me being the nerd I am, I had a couple questions towards the end about, like, lines of succession and, like, the stability of having a completely matriarchical, like, baron, would it be like baronship, thiefdom? I, I don't know. Uh, thing is is i think the kingdom did have a king okay because uh, yeah, there cool. was a there was a dude that had like shoulder length gray hair that was always standing next to connie britain at the end okay yeah okay that's the king but he did most that she did most of the talk she was the one that was actually part of the line from the ancient king yep mm -hmm. so that's why she was in control but yeah i I, I was more talking like on Ellie's side. They were talking about how like you know the three, the stepmother and her and her sister are gonna like run things. But I was like, huh. But like this is like a medieval esque society. How how would that really work? Would you still need like heirs? It would be the eldest. Yeah. Still would be. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah, it would probably be like a Tudor dynasty situation. But that that was just kind of the stuff I was thinking about. It didn't really. Again, it didn't really take away from the movie. It's just where my brain wandered. Yeah, yeah I do feel I, you. Because at one point in the movie. It did feel like they were doing as like part of this fantasy world that it was a matriarchal society. But then as we watch it, it's just like, no, it's just they happen to be women. Yeah. And and I mean in Connie Britton's case it was because she used she was the one who's directly descended from the ancient king. So she has more power in the situation because she's old blood, quite literally. Yeah. So uh, it looks like they were doing with the like at least main royal kingdom. Mm hmm Kinda like the uh the like British yeah. in modern yeah, yeah. IRL. Yeah, be, yeah. Uh, like I said, it feels very much similar to the uh Tudor dynasty. Um that is currently going on, um, currently active right oh, now. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. The, the Tudor. Yeah. The Tudor. Fa the Tudor family. The Tudor dynasty is like the whole. The whole thing from Henry the Eighth all the way up to uh, Elizabeth the First, okay. and then eventually, obviously, Liz the Second. 
I guess I just wasn't familiar with that term outside of the show. Yeah, I mean that's oh. why. Yeah, that's why the show was called the show. Or, but yeah. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, I I grew, I grew up I grew up in Virginia. We, we, for some reason, even though you know Virginia's the Virginia was one of the first and earliest states to you know start the American Revolution stuff. We learn a lot about British history here. That's probably why. Uh, but yeah. Because the whole adage of those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah, probably. Um, but yeah. So I, I think the world, like for what we got to see of it, was uh, very well done, uh, world building wise. <laughs> I think they've talked about uh, like that there is a possibility for them to do more set in this world. Also, the sequel. Also, I'm glad that like we had a dragon, but they didn't feel the need to like give her magic items or you know ha make her have some kind of like inborn superpower that she awakens to. Mm -hmm. Like she she was a regular girl fighting for her life who almost died on several occasions if it wasn't for magical healing bacteria. Yep. Also, the dragon didn't need to be like humongous smog size. Yeah. The fact that it's a dragon is just fucking scary on its own. Mm -hmm. And of course, they incorporate the classical dragon weakness of like the the underscale. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty dope. But, uh, but they did also add some interesting fantastic well, semi-fantastical elements that leaned on realistic stuff, like the uh, healing glowworms. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I just call, I just called them Bacta, because that's basically what it was, Bacta from Star Wars. <laughs> like it even I looks like the, it, it even looks like the same kind of goo that you see in the Bacta <laughs> tanks. Kinda, yeah. That is the goo. Oh man. Which, by the way, that. That was a really cool moment where Elodie was like, yeah, I beat the shit out of you, but I'm going to heal you. Mm -hmm. Again, shows her character. Uh, but yeah, overall, great movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, uh, we actually gave our initial rating uh, right after we watched it, which is some watched it, which is something we don't normally do. And to be honest, I'm going to stick with mine. I give it a solid eight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. for me, I want to go with after talking about it for a while, I want to give it a solid. Actually, yeah, I'll give it a solid eight point five. Actually. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Brian. Well, before I give it, because this is final thoughts too. Yeah, yeah, of I course. I want to say one other thing that they did that kind of subverted it, which I really like, mm -hmm. is the fact that they gave us a fantasy female lead who enjoyed being pretty. Like she actually liked. Yeah. Being yeah. It, pretty. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't like. It wasn't one of those like. Uh. Yeah. I'm a, uh, like. I'm a complete. Like you're the complete Arya Stark, right? Like where. Yeah. You 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 yeah. you like riding around, playing swords, and doing all that stuff. But you hate like all the courtly stuff, all the dresses. No, she liked all that shit, and she was very good at it. Her etiquette and manners were impeccable. But she also enjoyed riding horses and was very athletic, and mm -hmm. had, had like this great wanderlust and um you know thirst for adventure. Yeah. yeah. Now, now that was very cool. I definitely enjoyed that. I'm gonna end this by saying that I'm actually on the same page as Jay. Uh, my writing hadn't really change from our initial talk so i'm gonna agree with jay giving it solid eight. all right so overall a uh, great movie uh definitely receives the channel Tisher's stamp of approval uh now that we're wrapping up brian why don't you tell the lovely folks at home what we will be covering next week okay so if we stick to our schedule which we've been known to a lot lately we change it up but uh, next if we go to our current schedule mm -hmm. we are going to be talking about um, another Netflix project starring a uh, strong independent woman, but five instead of one. Yep. Girls Five Ever. We're going to be talking about some of it, at least. Probably the first half, because we, we discovered that the, uh, like, the episode count and uh, size of episode are pretty easy to get through. So mm -hmm. we're going to... It's still three seasons. Yeah. We're going to see how far we get. Yeah. We're going to see how far we get to, like, actually tell you, um... Like, but, uh, we're, we're experimenting. We want to see if we can, you know, if, uh, you know, old, not only older stuff resonates, but like, if we, if we do previous seasons of a show to catch up to a show, uh, would you guys still be into that? Uh, if you are interested, feel free to let us know in the comments. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that pretty much wraps up this week's episode of the Channel Tisha's podcast. I'd